Welcome to Music in the News and the Bible, evaluating popular music, the artists, and their performances with Judgment Day honesty. For more information about Music in the News and the Bible, visit doubleedgemusic.com. Here is gospel recording artist Troy Isaacs. Thank you for taking the time to tune into the show. I am your host, Troy Isaacs. As usual, my goal is to help you examine your music, the artists, and their performance with Judgment Day Honesty. If there's an artist you would like me to do a story on, please send an email to info at doubleedgemusic.com. I'd like to wish all of you a miraculous Christmas and a healthy, happy, and holy New Year. I pray that uh, you enjoy this holiday season with your friends, and please don't forget that Christ is the reason for the season, and uh, He is the best gift that we could ever get. For the scripture says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Singer Lauren Daigle has been enjoying the success of her sophomore album, Look Up Child, and says that she will not compromise her faith while traveling the world, ministering to those outside of the church. Daigle's Look Up Child debuted at number three on the Billboard 200 chart upon its release in September, beating out popular secular musicians such as Drake, Ariana Grande, Nicki Minaj, and Candy B. If you don't know who Ariana Grande is, she's the girl that said, if God was a woman, okay, she would be it. She wrote a song about that, and I may do a a show on that one day as well. Lauren said she will not compromise, and this is what she says. I think this passage that says, Go into the world and draw people unto him, the Great Commission, that, that's what I think about in regard to the mainstream aspect she maintained. I wasn't looking at making my music as in mainstream versus Christian album. I was like, okay, what is the purest version of me, or what is the purest thing that God has written into my spirit, and how do I express that? How do I communicate that? So she's like, I wasn't intending to make music for the masses and mainstream, the population. I was just thinking, I want to just communicate the pure message that God gave me to the world. That's basically what I take from what she said. The question you need to ask yourself is, is that what she did? And if you spent any time on social media, you know the answer to that question is no. All right. Following... Lauren Daigle's recent uh, stint on secular entertainment shows like The Ellen DeGeneres Show and The Jimmy Fallon Show, Dominique Natty said he wanted to ask about her stance as a Christian on homosexuality and whether it's a sin or not. And this is what Lauren said. I can't honestly answer on that in the sense of I have too many people that I love and they are homosexuals. I can't say one way or the other. I'm not God. When people ask questions like that, I just say, read the Bible and find out for yourselves. And when you find out, let me know, because I'm learning too, she added. Okay, so Lauren, I have a couple questions for you, and we'll tackle these things in the show. But for her to say, I can't say whether homosexuality is a sin or not, read the Bible. Well, let's look in the Bible for a second before we even uh, go through and deal with what I'm going to talk about. Leviticus 18.22 Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. I don't even have to read any other scriptures, guys. God is clear, dogmatic, straight. This is what he says. 1 Corinthians 6, 9-11 I'll just read this passage. I could pull out tons of them, but I won't. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God, be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulteresses, nor effeminates, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Effeminates and abusers of themselves could be lesbians and homosexuals. And then he says, verse 11, And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our Lord. Now let me just make it clear this in this broadcast today, my goal is not to condemn homosexuals. My goal is to cry out and appeal to Lauren 
and others who don't have enough courage like Joel Osteen and others to tell people that this is a sin. Now, I would encourage you, because obviously I can't deal with this issue. It's such a broad topic. I would encourage you to listen to the show I did on Empire and also the show I did on uh, the gentleman from Jaws of Clay. And I really dealt with, I think, about 10 different reasons why homosexual marriage is a bad thing. All right? And so I would encourage you to go check that out. But first of all, let's, in fact, let's deal with the compassion for homosexuals. Because, you know, someone may listen to this broadcast and may think that I have a problem with homosexuals or I hate them or whatever. No, my friends, I love all people. I don't care what sin you've committed. I don't care. Uh, we as God's people are commanded to love all people no matter what their convictions are, their lifestyle. We are commanded to love them. In fact, I, if you've listened to any of my shows, there was a time I had two young ladies that were lesbians that I worked with that were really good friends. And, you know, the scripture says of our Lord that he was a friend of publicans and sinners. And so I believe you as a child of God, you should have friends from all walks of life if God bring them in your path, because that's one way you could win them. But let's look at the compassion for homosexuals, all right, the compassion that we should extend toward them, all right? Um, I'm reading from an article, and I'm just going to take the points, but I'll, I'll add my own comments. This person wrote five ways to love your gay neighbor, all right? Five ways to love your gay neighbor, and this is written by Casey Hugh, okay? Casey B. Hugh. But number one, he says, we should love our gay neighbors Fearlessly. Now, where does he get the idea of neighbor? Well, Jesus, if you read in Luke 10, actually, Luke 10, Jesus begins to, you know, he's approached by this gentleman who says, um, you know, what is the great commandment? And his lawyer starts asking him questions. And uh, after Jesus asks him, well, you tell me what the greatest commandment is. And he says, well, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, well, well said. That is what, that is the summation of the entire Bible. Love God with everything, and love your neighbor as yourself. If you do that, you are fulfilling God's mandate for your life. But he, wanting to be smart and wise, says, well, Jesus, who then is my neighbor? And Jesus gives a a, a, a parable, or and I believe it's an actual story of what we know as the Good Samaritan. Now, if you know anything about the Jews, they hated the Samaritans because the Samaritans were half Jews, and so they hated them, and they would call them. And so the Samaritans were hated by the Jews. Well, of course, many people today hate homosexuals because of their lifestyle. But again, Paul says, such was some of you. All right, sin is sin. But the first thing we need to do to show our compassion for our homosexual brothers and sisters is we need to love them fearlessly. We need to not be afraid to share the gospel with them. The Bible says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind or self-control. Okay, so we should look for opportunities to share the gospel with our friends and our neighbors who are homosexuals. Why? Because Jesus says, whoever's ashamed of me and my word in this wicked and adulterous generation, of him will I also be ashamed of when I come in the glory of my Father and with his angels. And we cannot be like Miss Lauren Daigle, who when she was asked if homosexuality was a sin, was afraid to say the truth on that matter. Okay? We must be bold and courageous to stand up for Christ. And I think we need to get rid of this wishy-washy Christianity that we have in our day. I mean, the apostles, if you study your Bible, my friend, you will see most of the people mentioned in the New Testament were martyred. Even Nicodemus tradition tells us, okay, the one who was afraid and came to Jesus at night, when he got encountered by Christ, his life was so changed that he was willing to die for Christ. And you got people who don't have enough courage to stand up and tell someone that something is a sin. My friend, we are in the last hour of time. So we need to love 
everyone fearlessly and not be afraid of telling them what God says. The next thing we need to do is we need to love them with compassion. We need co compassion for them. We need to have pity. We need to have empathy for them. We need to feel sorry for them. The Bible says, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of tender mercies. Compassion. And he, you know, it goes through kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, patience. Bearing with one another. Again, why should we show compassion for them? Because Christ has shown compassion for us. The Bible says, Where in time past he was sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, full of malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But God, God again showed his love and his kindness towards us. So we should show compassion to our brothers and sisters who are homosexuals. Okay, we should look for opportunities to be kind to them. Like John Wesley who says, do all the good you can to all the people you can, by all the means you can, and all the ways you can, and all the times you can, as long as you ever can. Listen, you have a neighbor that's a homosexual? Go, go and have dinner with him. Okay? You have a neighbor that's, that's gay? Go and, and cut their lawn. Do something nice for them. Show compassion to them. You don't just need to, every time you see them, feel that you need to preach to them, you can show compassion, help take care of their children, show some love. Don't be scornful of them. Again, Jesus was a friend of publicans and sinners, and so we should be compassionate. Now, I applaud Lauren, who is trying to be compassionate toward homosexuals, but again, the next thing she did is she didn't do this third thing, which says we should love them truthfully. We should love them truthfully. What does that mean? It says, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. Okay? So we are to love our brothers in truth. In fact, this is why the Bible says of our Lord that he was full of grace and truth. You cannot have love without truth, my friend. A person must know that God is light, 1 John 1, 5, before he understands that God is love, 1 John 7 and 8. And you cannot have one without the other. We would not love Jesus as much as we love him if he did not tell us the truth about our destiny. If he did not say, my friends, I want to forewarn you whom you will fear. Do not fear the one that has power to destroy the body, but fear the one that can cast your body and soul into hell. You need to let your homosexual friends and neighbors know that they need to repent, that they need to fear God, that they need to turn from their sins. Just like you should tell your friend if he's an adulterer or a liar or if he is someone that is a thief or is abusing his children or committing any type of sin, you need to have the courage to tell them the truth. Paul says, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth. And if you study your Bible, you see what happened with, with Peter when he tried to compromise in regards to when he was asked if he knew Jesus. All right, and you see, he struggled with this most of his life. You get down to Galatians chapter 2, and he's sitting with the, gen with, the, with the Jews, and he's afraid to sit with the Gentiles because he had a fear of man. And many of God's people today are motivated by a fear of man. They are afraid of offending people. But oh, my friend, you need to have the courage to tell people the truth. All right? You need to have the, the courage to tell people the truth. The next thing is, you need to love your neighbor redemptively. What do I mean? You need to look for opportunities to, to be able to show your love to them so they can ask you, um, why is it that you've done what you've done? This is why you may have to go the extra mile. If somebody compelled you to go one mile, go with them too. Go beyond what they may expect. You may invite them to your house and you may think, oh man, he's going he's gonna to condemn me. He's going to talk about my sin. No, love them. Treat them well. You know, don't even mention anything about their sin. Just love them. And, uh, 
you know, and, and you may, and we're going to get into the Great Commission on how we can can reach them. But look for opportunities again. Titus three four to seven tells us that the kindness and love of God appeared towards us, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. All right. So look for opportunities. The Bible tells us that we are His ambassadors. We are the ones to communicate the love of God to a dying world. The Bible says, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself, and He has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So love them redemptively. Look for opportunities to love them and share Christ with them. Then, of course, you should love them patiently. Now, what do I mean patiently? Well, that means it may require you praying for them for a long time before you change, see them change. Paul says, I therefore, prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. So bearing with them in love. Now you know how patient God is with us. The Bible says God judges the righteous and he's angry with the wicked every day. Even though God is angry with the wicked every day and hates all workers of iniquity according to scripture, the Bible still tells us that his mercies are new every morning. But the Bible says God judges the righteous and he is angry with the wicked every day. We can love them with an eye of redemption. But now we're going to take a break and we're going to we're going to hear from our sponsors Mike and Brian over at Fellowship Home Loans and also we're going to hear a little of an individual I should have gotten the name and in fact I will look up his name and uh, he I think did an outstanding job of just talking about Lauren Daigle and the compromises and, and that she did to get where she is. All right, so we're going to take a break, and then we'll come back, and we'll talk a little more about the compromise, and uh, then we'll deal with the commission, the Great Commission. And I will take a break. Life can be difficult at times, and we may go through ups and downs or experience financial hardship. Maybe you had a loan modification, a short sale, or even filed for bankruptcy. Hey, everyone. This is Mike. And this is Brian of Fellowship Home Loans. You could be in a modified mortgage and not even realize that the rate is adjustable. Maybe it contains a balloon payment, or maybe you're not even paying any principal. A modification is a short-term fix. Call us today to get your mortgage evaluated and receive the truth about what you can qualify for. 800-804-SAVE. That's 800-804-7283. Or online at fellowshiphomeloans.com. All listeners receive two-month break in mortgage payments and $1,000 back at closing. Mortgage lending guided by Christian principles. Come and get your loan, Fellowship Home Loans. Intercontinental Capital Group, DBA, Fellowship Home Loans, Equal Housing Opportunity Lender, NMLS number 60134. Lauren Daigle was born on September 9, 1991 in Lafayette, Louisiana. After attending Louisiana State University, the singer competed in American Idol in 2010 and 2012, reaching the Hollywood round in the latter year. Eventually, Lauren was signed by Centricity, and her debut album, How Can It Be?, reached the top of the Christian charts in 2015. I am guilty. In a 2016 interview with the Christian Broadcasting Network, Lauren described how she remained strong in the faith despite the tragic death of her grandfather, who she was very close with. In the midst of this great sorrow, there was so much joy because I could see the process of my grandfather entering into the gates, entering into the streets of gold. He saw all the, the hearts that were going to be touched through my grandfather's legacy and what I did with, with his stories that he told me and how I transferred those into songs and then now the hearts of all of these people are being intersected with the glory of God. Notice that in 2016 she says that listeners of her music are being transformed with the glory of God. Her vocabulary in 2018 is going to be very, very different and so is her platform. Talk to me about what it's like to have your music out there and just having people respond the way they are. Wow, yeah, I'm blown away. We've been getting like, You Say came out and so many people have been responding just like about suicide like that song is affecting so many people that have either tried to commit suicide or were about to commit suicide and you see like 
on the platform where people are saying, hey, this song just saved me, this song saved me. And then other people reach out and say, well, I'm in that place, can you help me? And you start to see this like beautiful community get started just through music. So it's powerful. Music is so powerful. How does someone tell you that, that you essentially potentially saved their lives? Like, what is that? Yeah. How does that feel? Do you, is, that, is, it, is it stressful to have that kind of pressure on you? Or do you just feel like you're living your, your truth? Okay, so here's an opportunity. Lauren had just stated that people have told her that they have been saved from committing suicide through her music. And the reporter is actually prodding her here. She asked, is it stressful to have that pressure on you or are you living your truth? So what is Lauren's truth? Is she going to talk about Jesus? Will she mention the transforming power of the gospel? What do we get? I think I, I think of it as in a way of living through your truth, for sure, but also like letting it do its work on its own. Like with or without me, like... My ho- hope is that people get touched by music through any form, through any medium. So I think for me, there's moments where I can feel the pressure on my chest like, whoa, there's a weightiness to everything that we do. But I, I choose to just stick with the fun. I'm like, where's the party at? Let's have a good time. So there you have it. My hope is that people get touched by music. And where's the party at? Let's have a good time. How did the glory of God in 2016 get replaced by the power of music in 2018? May I suggest that when your top priority is to sell as many albums as you can to as wide an audience as you can, and the message of the vast majority of those songs is not the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ to a fallen world, this is what you get. Complete and total compromise. After the AMAs, Lauren appeared on The Ellen Show. Some have suggested the connection has to do with Ellen being a judge when Lauren was on American Idol. Some Christians were puzzled as to why Ellen, one of the most famous lesbians in entertainment, known for her pro-LGBT and anti-Christian stances, would have invited a Christian musician to perform on her show. After all, Ellen had previously reneged on an invitation given to gospel singer Kim Burrell after Ellen learned that Kim had called homosexuality a sin. Incidentally, the song Ellen chose for Lauren to sing on her show was vague and doesn't mention Jesus once. In fact, another criticism of Lorne is that her songs are watered down and rarely ever mention the name of Christ. Why did Ellen praise Lauren Daigle's powerful performance? This article doesn't tell me, but if you take a look at the lyrics to this Christian song, it's not hard to understand why. It's written in such a way that it can't be offensive. I think about Paul Washer saying the problem with most preachers these days is that nobody wants to kill them. The problem with a lot of contemporary Christian music is it's so blah Nobody's ever offended by it. And we should be. There should be music that stirs and challenges and convicts. Lauren shot back at critics by saying, I think the second we start drawing lines around which people are able to be approached and which aren't, we've already completely missed the heart of God. I don't have all the answers in life, and I'm definitely not going to act like I do. But the one thing that I know for sure is I can't choose who I'm supposed to be kind to and who I'm supposed to show love to and who I'm not. Because that's the mission, right? Be who Christ was to everyone. I really wonder if Ellen would have been as accommodating if Lauren had taken James White's position on first. Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Somehow I doubt it. Lauren has also been added to the YouTube Billboard channel. A video called 11 Things About Lauren Daigle You Should Know, designed to get new viewers to get to know the singer, was uploaded on October 19th. Why should people listen to my music? Why should people listen to her music? She's a Christian musician. Christian means a follower of Jesus Christ, right? Okay, let's hear her answer. Because um, I think the message is one of hope and unity. And right now we're in crazy times in the world, and I think that people want to have love to hold on to. They want to have truth to hold on to. They want to be able to sit next to someone and not feel like everyone is a stranger in the world. If my life was a book, the title would be... So Christians, if someone asked you if your life was a book, what would the title be? How would you respond? Think about it for a minute. Would you include something about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Maybe just somewhere in there? Here's how Lauren answered. How to live like a child in an adult-proof world. So there you have it. This is the face of mainline Christianity. This is a young lady whose YouTube channel has more subscribers than John MacArthur, James White, and Jeff Durbin combined. Lauren has now developed a platform and an audience that 99% of us will never have. Well, let's hope for the best for Lauren. Peter denied the Lord three times and then he was proclaiming the gospel at Pentecost. You never know what can happen, but right now it's not looking good. Okay, so I actually hope uh, you found that information helpful. And I would encourage you guys, please let's pray for Lauren and many of these artists because they get caught up in the popularity and the fame. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, how compromises. And this is nothing new. She even has a song called Losing My Religion. And if you've 
Listen to the show I did on Kirk Franklin. Many of these artists say they're losing their religion. They don't understand the Bible. The scripture lets you know that pure and undefiled religion before God is to visit the fatherless and the widows and their affliction. We should be proud to have a religion. But again, that's another Bible study. You can listen to the show I did on Kirk Franklin. The enemy tries to tell you, well, you don't need rules. You don't need all these things. But again, Jesus says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. All right, there is a sacrifice. There are rules. There are things that you have to do as a Christian to show your commitment to God. Now again, Lauren said that first of all, that hearts are being impacted by, are intercepted by the glory of God. Now again, this, the author, the one that did the YouTube video, and I wish I could have found who it was. When I first found it, I, I made a copy of it um, and edited it for the show. But unfortunately, I can't know who it is to give the guy the credit. So if you do come across this show, please forgive me for not mentioning your name. Again, you sound like you're a godly person. You probably wouldn't care about that anyway. You sound like you just want to see Christ and Him exalted. So praise the Lord. But her response was the hearts are being intercepted with the glory of God. The question is, how do you get, again... From the glory of God to a point where now you are more concerned about how popular your music is and how the power of your music is impacting others. And again, the, 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 the author brings this out. The, the, the person that's interviewing her, Chelsea, says, you have saved their lives. These people are committing suicide, are thinking of committing suicide, and you saved their lives with your music. She could have easily have said, listen... It's not me, it was Christ. He is the Savior. He's the one that, that em empowered me to write the songs I wrote to impact the hearers. But all the glory goes to God. But she didn't do any of that. All right? Then she, she's, the, 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 uh, the, Chelsea also asked her if she's living, are you living your truth? Again, she could have responded and said, I'm not living my truth. I'm living the truth of the gospel. I'm living the truth of Christ who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. But the question you need to ask is, how could she get to a point where all of these statements are, are just so cowardly? They're not even, uh, not even enough courage to speak about Christ. Well, I'll tell you one thing can be uh, church, our commitment to church. I don't know how committed she is to church, and I don't know if she spends time in church. I know right now she's on tour uh, promoting her album, and so if you're not in a place where you're constantly being uh, provoked and encouraged by the Word of God and the people of God and just hearing godly sermons and other things and being provoked with your life, you are not going to live a life that is pleasing to God. One of the things Luke tells us in the book of Acts says, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching and fellowship and breaking of bread and of prayers. Okay, something I read about Lauren, someone asked her, what practical advice and, and encouragement can you give on how to read the Bible? This is what she said. I would set goals for myself and I would say, okay, I want to read the New Testament, but I don't know how. I know that I can't just sit down and start from the beginning because I need things in short bursts. So I would start with Matthew and read through it and write about it, a journal. And I would digest that. Okay, I say that's commendable. Good, you read Matthew, journal about it, digest it. That, that's what the Bible tells us. We should meditate on the Word of God. We should digest it. It should become a part of us. And that's why the Bible says this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. Okay, if you're filled with the word, it's going to come out of your mouth. But then she says, then when I was ready, I would move on to the next book. I would read one chapter a day. That was all I needed. If I was tired, I would just read one paragraph. Okay, so this is the young lady that is leading many of our congregations in worship. And many of God's people love her music. But this person says, I only spend, I only read one chapter of the Bible a day. One chapter. So this is the person 
Now, the Bible tells you about, in Ephesians, it says, in Colossians 3.15, says, The word of Christ should dwell in you richly, speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. Yet, Lauren says, I spend one chapter in the Bible. Now, this was written a few years ago, so I'll be fair, maybe she spends more time, but I, I would be surprised if she does, because I'm sure her life is so demanding. And if you have not practiced spending time in the Word, someone says, the Word of God will keep you from sin, and sin will keep you from the Word of God. Okay, so there is the compromise. The compromise, and we need to really pray for her and ask God to really do a work of grace in her life. Because if she continues on this path, uh, boy, I, I'm afraid to see where she will end up. Okay, so there you have the compromise. Now again, Job said, I esteem thy word, I desire thy word more than my necessary food. Peter said, where should we go, Lord? You alone have the words of eternal life. Jesus, God in flesh, says man should not live by bread alone, but by every word. Yet, Lauren thinks that she can function on one chapter a day of the Bible. My friends, let's not get it twisted. Okay? Jeremiah said that words were found and I did eat them. Okay? David said, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? but by taking heed according to thy word. All the saints throughout history understood the importance of meditating on the word. Somebody said meditation plus contemplation brings revelation. And so you need to spend time in the word of God daily. So there you have the compromise with homosexuality. And again, the reason she could compromise, and she may not have the discernment. She may be right. Maybe she doesn't know. That homosexuality is a sin. If you're spending one one chapter in the Bible and it takes you 28 days to read a book in the Bible, then she may not have come across 1 Corinthians 6 and 9. She may not have read Leviticus and the other passages that deal with homosexuality. Or if you're in a church where pastors are not preaching these things, she's not going to know that. Okay? So there you have the compromise. Okay, let's look at the commission, the Great Commission. The Bible says we should go therefore into all the world and make disciples of all nations, right? It also says that we are to preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Even uh, Luke tells us, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall receive power to be witnesses unto me. So we as God's people have a responsibility to go everywhere at all times and tell everyone about the good news. But the question you need to ask yourself is how do I give the gospel to homosexuals, especially if I approach them and tell them that this is a sin and they're going to shut down? Well, one of the things that I've done in my own experience is I don't even talk about homosexuality up front. One of the things I do is I go through the commandments. And you can do this. My friend, have you ever told a lie before? Okay, how does God feel about lying? The Bible says all liars will have their part in the lake of fire. When was the last time you told a lie? Okay, have you been forgiven of that lie? I mean, you could just ask them questions. Or have you ever stolen anything before? What do you call someone that steals something? They're a thief. Okay? You don't necessarily have to address that particular sin. You can address other sins. And as they open up and begin to be convicted about other sins, then you can say, by the way, and I did this with two women on a bus, or one lady on a bus, actually. I said to the woman, I said, um... Have you ever desired to be with another woman? Because she was a homosexual. And she said, yes. I said, you know, the Bible says, if you look at another person with lust in your heart, you have already committed adultery with her in your heart. And the Lord was able to use not just her actions, but the very attitude that she had toward that lifestyle and that sin. And I was able to speak to her about more things. So one thing you can do is, again, speak about the commandments. Another thing you can do is you can speak about 
your life. You can talk about how God changed your life and how you were once, like I, you know, I used to be an alcoholic. I used to drink a lot, you know. You could start talking about things that you were, the Bible says such was some of you, but now you are washed. Or you can talk about others who were homosexuals. There's a, a, an organization called Exodus, and these guys work with individuals that are practicing that lifestyle, and they share with them the importance of getting out of that lifestyle. And you can, I mean, you can even do a search on YouTube and read testimonies and listen to videos and watch videos of people who were in that type of lifestyle. Another thing you can do is you can confront them. Yes, I said it, my friends. You can confront them. You can let them know that if they continue in their sins, God will judge them. Whether they like it or not, God, someone says, when men invented new ways of sinning, God invented new ways of judging. And that's when God poured out fire from heaven and destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So you can let them know that they need to repent from that sin because God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. You can also tell them about God's love. Listen, my friend, you in your heart understand that something's wrong here, okay? You can read Heather Has Two Mommies, and you can read life stories of individuals. You know, one young lady I was reading in, a, in, a, in another broadcast who talked about how horrible her life was because she didn't have a father in the home. She had two mommies raising her. And just all of the different things she went through. And the Bible says, again, pure and undefiled religion is to visit the fatherless and the widow in their affliction. What do these groups of people have in common? The fatherless are orphans, are individuals that don't have a man, they don't have a father. And the widows are those women that don't have a husband. God says any home that does not have a father is an afflicted home. Okay? So when you are raising a culture where there are two women raising a child, that is an affliction. Or where there's no father, no male, that's an affliction. And obviously if you don't have a female in that home, that is an affliction as well. So you can begin to just talk about various things. And I'll even ask them questions like, how did you, how did you become a homosexual? Was this, was this something you were born with? Tell me what happened. They might say, yeah, I was born with it. But when did you first know that? And I guarantee if they begin to explain, they may say, well, you know, I was molested as a child, or I was sexually abused, or something like, something unexpected happened. So we should again look for opportunities for the Great Commission to reach these souls, okay, and share with them the love of God. Now, how do I want to end this show? Well, number one, again, we should continue to show compassion for homosexuals. Do things for them. Look for opportunities to share the love of Christ with them. Invite them into your home. Yes, I know. Oh, wow, I'm bringing them among my children. Yes, bring them among your children. Let them see what a family life is like. Let them see what it's like to have a man and a woman raise children rather than them trying to do it. I can guarantee if you were to spend time with homosexuals, many of them are struggling with suicide and other things because... That is not how they were created. God made them male and female. Okay? So let's show compassion toward our homosexual brothers and sisters. And number two, do not compromise with them. Don't be afraid to tell them the truth. Okay? We have a saying, we say, a man persuaded against his will is of the same opinion still. If someone is convinced that something is wrong and they don't want to hear you, no matter what you do for them, they will continue in their sin. Just ask Judas Iscariot, who was with Jesus, who cleansed the leper, healed the sick, raised the dead, preached the gospel to the poor, and all the mighty things he did. Scripture says, if everything Jesus did was written in the book, the world cannot contain the book. Yet, with all of that revelation, with all of that light, Judas still went to hell. Why? Because he wanted to go to hell. He wanted to stay in his sins. Okay? He wanted to continue in his sins. And no matter what Christ did, he continued in that. So a person that's persuaded against their will is of the same opinion still. And only God can change the heart. And lastly, my friend, you want to remember the Great Commission. Homosexuals are people that need the gospel as well. They need to experience the love of God as well. And we need to pray for them, not avoid them. 
I believe every child of God, if you've been walking with the Lord long enough, should at least have some encounter with someone that is a homosexual and seek to reach them with the love of Christ. Again, I hope and pray you found this information helpful. For more music in the news and the Bible topics, visit doubleedgemusic.com. Or if you have ideas for other topics, please email us at info at doubleedgemusic.com.